Welcome to Oak Hills Community Church. I'm glad you all have joined us in person today. And for those of, us, those of you who are joining us online, I'm glad you've joined us. You probably want to join us in person on the 24th. That's just a pro tip. Uh, barbecue will be in the house that day. So uh, let's go ahead and get started with our service. We're going to pray and we're going to sing. Uh, so let's stand together. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace. We thank you, Father, that you've brought each and every one of us here to worship you. We thank you, Father, that we have the freedom to do that and without fear of persecution. Uh, Father, we, we know you're worthy of our worship, and we pray that as we, as we focus our minds on you, that you would help us to leave the cares of this world at your feet so that we really may focus on worshiping you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's start with all glory, laud, and honor. Sometimes the best. I know. My phone, it stopped doing it. All right. One, two, three, four. shake hands with one another, and Stuart's going to come and give us our announcements, so you'll have to sit down in a minute. Good morning, Oak Hills Community Church. What a beautiful day it is. It sure is nice that the weather got a little cooler recently. I uh, want to welcome everyone here, whether you are a long-term member, first-time guest, visitor. It is a blessing to worship the Lord with you today. So thank you for being here. Uh, announcements. First of all, the most important thing is our Thanksgiving feast. And it's, I just say it's most important because I'm hungry and I like to eat. So, But it's going to be Sunday, November 24th, the Sunday before Thanksgiving. It'll be right after church. So we, 
Instead of when we dismiss church, we go out that door and that you'll be amazed at the line of food that will, you'll have a tray and you get up all loaded up and then go find a place to sit. Um, there are sign-up sheets out in the foyer if you would like to contribute and bring a side or a dessert or a salad or something. Please uh, feel free to contribute if you feel so led. Um, let's see. Oh, yeah. And I, I apologize. I did not have time to prepare announcements this morning, so I'm kind of winging it. Please forgive me. We do have Operation Christmas Child. The empty boxes are out there. We need to return the filled boxes by Sunday, November the 24th. Uh, there are instructions out there, and there's a website you can go on about the uh, stuff you can get for the kiddos. And remember, those are Christmas boxes. The shoe boxes are going to bring Christmas to children all over the world in orphanages, and many of them have never heard of Jesus Christ. This may be their first Christmas ever, is what you give them. So it's a, it's a wonderful ministry. Um, make sure that those boxes are filled up by November 24th. Let's see, what else? I think, I think that's it. Oh, right. Uh, the Thanksgiving Day feast at our house. Totally forgot that. <clears throat> So uh, we've opened up our home to anybody that would like to, to join us for Thanksgiving. You are invited. We are not going to send out written invitations, so you just have to come. Uh, our address, if you look on the small groups on the inside left of your uh, bulletin, the Tuesday, 7 p.m., that's our home address right there. We live in Denton. Uh, if you want to bring a side dish or a dessert or some rolls or your favorite iced tea, or lemonade, or Dr. Pepper, whatever. You can bring whatever you want. You don't have to bring anything. But we have our sit-down meal at noon. Uh, but then people, we leave everything out, and people will come over. If they've got other things to do in the morning, people will come over at 4 or 5 o'clock and continue to eat and graze, and watch football, play card games. We had a pretty severe uno game last year right i mean it got almost violent yeah it was duke it got violent okay trying to try to keep it calm duke next this year okay uh let's see oh enjoy singing the oak hills community church ladies chorus if you enjoy singing and you are female you can contact Kathy and get involved with that. Um, I think that's it. Anything else? Did I miss anything? Forget anything? Wouldn't surprise me. Okay. Nothing that I'm aware of. But then I didn't look at the announcements either. So. <laughs> that's right. That's a violin, all right. Well, I'll tell you what, we're going to continue worshiping. I would bring you up to speed. I'm just going to bring you up to speed. No venison as of yet. I did see four doe and one spike buck out there at the grasslands this week, just about 10 yards outside of bow range. So guess what I'm bringing next week? Well, not this week. I'm going to be in D.C., but next time I go, I'm bringing the muzzle loader. I can reach out to about 150 yards with that, so <laughs> accurately at 150 yards. It'll, I could shoot further, but wouldn't hit it. Well, let's stand together and continue singing. This is almost completely all hymns this week, um, all but one. You'll figure out which one that is. We're going to start with A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. Our helper, He amid the flood of mortal ills prevailing. For still our ancient foe does seek to work us woe. His craft our great and on with cruel hate on earth is not his equal did we in our own strength confide our striving 
Could do it the other way around, but it canceled. Out. <clears throat> it canceled out. Boy, that technology, you just can't live with it. You can shoot it, but you can't live with it. There we go. All right. All good says, yep. In the name of the Father. In the name of the Son, in the name of the Spirit, Lord, we've come. We're gathered together to lift up your name, to call on our Savior, to fall on your grace. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Spirit, Lord, we've come. We're gathered together to lift up your name, to call on your Savior, to fall on your grace. Hear the joyful sound of our offering as your saints bow down, as your people sing. We will rise with you it on your wings and the world will see that our God saves our God saves there is hope in your name In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Spirit, Lord, we've come. We're gathered together to lift up your name, to call on our Savior, to fall on your grace. Hear the joyful sound of our offering as your saints bow down as your people sing we will rise with you lifted on your wings and the world will see that our god saves our god saves there is hope in your
Hear the joyful sound of our offering As your saints bow down, as your people sing We will rise with you, lifted on your wings And the world will see that Yes, the world will see that Our God saves
Father, we've come to praise you, and I, I pray, Father, that our, our voices, our, our, our praise to you has been worthy of who you are. We know we can't really get there because you are infinite and you're worthy of infinite praise. But, Father, we pray that you've been honored in Jesus' name. Amen. Y- y'all can have a seat. And uh, <clears throat> Lois is coming up to do the prayer time, and my voice is going to stop now. So go ahead. Good morning. How good it is to gather together on a beautiful day to visit, to worship, and now bow our heads in praising and asking God for his blessings. Eternal, sovereign God, we thank you for your mercy. We are grateful for peace and general order that you guided in our election process. Our elected officials need your wisdom and your mighty hand heavy on their shoulders. Loving Father, in your merciful kindness, provide miraculous healing and comfort to our needs. Open your hand to healing and comfort from cancer for Jim and Rod, for Kathy and David and Will and Danielle, each needing healing from cancer. Janet also needs recovery from a stroke, and Mike needs hope and medical assistance for the best treatment of his nervous system. Winnell needs her blood clots eradicated and pain from relief from a severe fall she took. Bill needs the mass on his kidney removed. Beverly seeks answers from medical testing results. Father, we ask, too, that you provide one to step in for Cindy. She needs a safe place to stay, complete repair of her home. We thank you for a sale of Marie's casita and a closer place for her coach to be stored and sold. Bless us who grieve, comfort them with hope, strengthen those who care for others in need and give us strong hearts of compassion. Help us think, what would Jesus do? While we remember, what did Jesus do? Help us to love boldly and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. About a month ago, we were a divided nation. And as I reflected on what people were saying on Facebook and in person and on the news, I I realized that, that this had reached a new fever pitch that I wasn't even familiar with. At the time, we were saying that the election was less than a, a, a percentage point for the national presidential election and could go either way. And uh, so at that time, reflecting on the things that were going on, I made a decision on what I would preach to beginning today and for three weeks to come. I'm going to preach on something to get our minds on a different track. Rather than the presidential race or politics or the national level, I want us to think higher. I'm going to talk to you today about the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God. God has a great kingdom. It's glorious. It is, he is in control now. It may not seem like it, but he is. He is in control now, and he will turn everything right in the future. His kingdom is a glorious kingdom. Now, someone might look around today and see things in the condition they are and say, is this the best there is? God, can't you do a little better? (laughs) But why are things the way they are? I submit to you it's not God's fault. The blame, unfortunately, rests on modern man. 
and modern man's rebellious heart. Consider individuals. Is the average individual you know committing his way or her way to the Lord? Are they looking to the Lord for direction and following him and him only? Or many of the individuals I know, I'm not talking about you particularly, but, but people I know out in the world, they're seeking what they want. They're seeking excitement. They're seeking possessions. They're seeking a thrill. They're seeking all kinds of things outside of the Lord. They're trying to find meaning in life apart from the Lord. And as one person said, how's that working for you? And some of the people I know that are trying to find meaning in life apart from God, it's not working. Consider families. I have seen heartbreaking stories of real lives of families that have lost their way. Many kids and parents can't get along and don't function well. And if nothing changes, and nothing changes unless there's a real intentional purpose of change, then the product will be broken families and will be continually seeing broken lives. Consider the church. The non-Christian society at large has failed to take the person and work of Christ seriously. And I think that we as a church, not so much this church, but the church universal, has failed to have an impact in the lives of people. And as a result, they don't believe in Christ. We have what we might call a drive-through Christian spirituality. <laughs> this has led to weak churches, resulting in a weak nation. And friends, I'm going to say that what we need is not so much for the world to embrace our view of, of God, but for us to embrace our view of God and really hold it to be true and conform our lives to the Lord of glory. In ancient times, men and women turned from God and tried to find meaning in their own terms, apart from God. And as we will see in our passage today, which is Daniel chapter 4, if you want to turn in your Bibles or on your cell phones, that's the passage we'll be looking at today, Daniel chapter 4. And you will see the result can be that God is ticked. And when his patience is gone, it's gone. Then he begins to judge and chaos and confusion takes over in the lives of rebellious people. God becomes the cause of the nation's distress. Tony Evans writes, Now when God is your problem, then only God is your solution. If God is ticked off, it doesn't matter who you elect or what programs you initiate. Until his anger is assuaged, you won't be able to fix what's wrong or spend enough money to buy your way out of the dilemma. This is the heart of our problems today. Too many individuals, families, churches, and communities want to keep God on the fringes of our lives there he can be accessible if we need him, but we can keep him far enough away from the center of our lives that he doesn't start messing with our agenda. As long as we keep God at a distance, he will not take the control center of our lives. And unrighteousness will rule. He will be close enough for invocations and benedictions but no part of the in-between. The net result of all this is that we are seeing the devolution, not evolution, not upward progress, but the devolution of mankind. The more we marginalize God, the worse things get. 
This is what Paul said in Romans chapter 1 when he wrote, The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. And then in the following verses after that one, you see the downward spiral of mankind apart from God, living apart from his wisdom, his guidance, his godliness. So the solution to today's problems is to move from rejection of God's kingdom to accepting it. In this chapter, we will look at the classic case of someone who stiff arms God out of his life and what had to happen to set things straight. Let's look at Daniel chapter 4. It may be broken up into three sections like three acts of a play. So here we go. Scene one. Nebuchadnezzar. And by the way, you've, you've heard of this guy, right? Famous hanging gardens of Babylon, right? This powerful king, very large kingdom. Nebuchadnezzar had a dream of a great tree. And so let's begin reading in verse 1. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at home in my palace, contented and prosperous. I had a dream that made me afraid. I was lying in bed, and the images and visions that passed through my mind terrified me. So I commanded that all the wise men of Babylon be brought before me to interpret the dream for me. When the magicians, enchanters, astrologers, and diviners came, I told them the dream. But they could not interpret it for me. Finally, Daniel came into my presence, and I told him the dream. He's called Belteshazzar, after the name of my God, and the spirit of the holy gods is in him. Now, obviously, Nebuchadnezzar is still a polytheist. Now, sometime earlier in his reign, he had acknowledged God, at least at some level. Uh, he'd had an encounter previously with Daniel in chapter 2, and uh, he had come to see God as, as real. But he still had all these other gods. And so he has his God and their gods and their gods, and then finally Yahweh God, and they put them all on the shelf, kind of on an even level. And he had no particular allegiance to Yahweh. You know, it's kind of like uh, people today. Many think, well, you have your God, and you have your God, and this group has <laughs> their particular religion, and you have your religion, and there's no one that isn't particularly true. You know, they're all just as good as another. Sounds very modern. Sounds very non-committal. But the problem with this view is that it fails by not realizing the true God is a king. He rules. You don't say to a king, especially a powerful one, that you have no responsibility to acknowledge or to obey him. You see, Nebuchadnezzar's mindset was much like today. But if everyone is in charge, then no one is in charge. If every religion is equally valid, hey, we don't have to listen to one authority over another. At the point where this passage and the point that this passage drives home with power is that there is one being, one king, one who is in control. Now, this is something that is not easy for Nebuchadnezzar to accept. He's going to have to go through the ringer before he gets to the point where he's willing to accept God as the true king. And obey God. And I think sometimes people today have the same dilemma. 
we can get so hard-headed. We can resist God. We may know what he wants and still resist him. Our pride pushes us to hold on to control at all costs. You know, Americans celebrate independence, right? We don't celebrate subservience. <laughs> we want to be independent. We want to be in charge of our own future. And somehow bowing down to another, to the God of the Bible, and acknowledging him as our Lord is difficult. But it's important to do. Without acknowledge, we do. We need to. Amen. From the mouths of babes. Amen. <laughs> I'm glad he said that because that's something that a lot of us won't say in America. We need to acknowledge God. We do. At this point in our story, the king shares what has been troubling him. I said, Belteshazzar, this is what King Nebuchadnezzar renamed Daniel. Who's Daniel? He's, he's a Hebrew. He's a Jewish young man that was taken from his homeland and uh, brought to Babylon. And he was trained as, a, uh, as an advisor to the king. But he is a prophet of God because God, the true God, used him as a mouthpiece. He said, Belteshazzar, chief of the magicians, I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in you. And no mystery is too difficult for you. Here is my dream. Interpret it for me. These are the visions I saw while lying in bed. I looked, and there before me stood a tree in the middle of the land. Its height was enormous. The tree grew large and strong, and its top touched the sky. It was visible to the ends of the earth. Its leaves were beautiful, its fruit abundant, and on it was food for all. Under it, the wild animals found shelter, and the birds lived in its branches. From it, every creature was fed. In the visions I saw while lying in bed, I looked, and there before me was a holy one, a messenger, coming down from heaven. He called in a loud voice, cut down the tree and trim off its branches, strip off its leaves and scatter its fruit. But let the stump and its roots bound with iron and bronze remain in the ground, in the grass of the field. Let him be drenched with the dew of heaven, and let him live with the animals along with the plants of the earth. Let his mind be changed from that of a man, and let him be given the mind of an animal till seven times pass by for him. The decision is announced by messengers. The Holy One declares the verdict so that the living may know the Most High is sovereign over all the kingdoms on earth and gives to them, gives them to anyone he wishes and sets over them the lowliest of people. This is the dream that I, King Nebuchadnezzar had. Now, Belteshazzar, tell me what it means. For no one, uh, none of the wise men in my kingdom can interpret it for me. But you can, because the spirit of the holy gods is in you. God gave the king a dream. The focus of the dream was a tree, an enormous one reaching to the heavens. It was a place of shelter, but in spite of its size and significance, an order is given to cut it down. 
yet the stump with its roots remain in the ground. Now, note the change here. The writer shifts and uses the personal pronoun, he. This tree is representative of a person. This dream represents a person. The prediction goes from bad to worse. As the messenger says, let him be given the mind of an animal until seven times pass by for him. The purpose is so that the living may know that the Most High is sovereign over all the kingdoms on earth and gives them to anyone he wishes. All right, that's scene one. We've come to a close. But we come to scene two, and here Daniel interprets the dream. Verse 19. Then Daniel, also called Belteshazzar, was greatly perplexed for a time, and his thoughts terrified him. So the king said, Belteshazzar, do not let the dream or its meaning alarm you. Belteshazzar, remember we're talking about the prophet Daniel, he answered, My Lord, if only the dream applied to your enemies and its meaning to your adversaries. The tree you saw, which grew large and strong with its top touching the sky, visible to the whole earth, with beautiful leaves and abundant fruit, providing food for all, giving shelter to the wild animals, and having nesting places in its branches for the birds. Your majesty, you are that tree. You have become great and strong. Your greatness has grown until it reaches the sky and your dominion extends to the distant parts of the earth. Such was ancient Babylon under Nebuchadnezzar. As Daniel reflected on the meaning, he is startled at the identity of the subject. Daniel is polite to Nebuchadnezzar, but I believe that he really respects his king. Daniel senses, no doubt with God's enablement, that the dream applies to the king. And the message is ominous. But he doesn't try to change the meaning of the message. He tells the king, your majesty, you are that tree. Daniel continues. Verse 23, your majesty saw a holy one, a messenger coming down from heaven and saying, cut down the tree and destroy it, but leave the stump bound with iron and bronze. And then he goes down and he says, let him live with the wild animals until seven times pass by for him. This is the interpretation. Your majesty, this is the decree of the most high. He is issued against my Lord, the king. You will be driven away from people and will live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like an ox and be drenched with the dew of heaven. Seven times will pass by for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over all the kingdoms on earth, and he gives them to anyone he wishes. The command to leave the stump of the tree with its roots means that your kingdom will be restored to you when you acknowledge that heaven rules. I like that. Heaven rules. Would you say that with me? Heaven rules. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> All right. Therefore, your majesty, 
Be pleased to accept my advice. Renounce your sins by doing what is right and your wickedness by being kind to the oppressed. It may be that your prosperity will continue. By the way, isn't that great news? We all fall short in one way or another. We all have failed to be as holy as God. But God allows us a period of repentance. God allows us time to change our minds concerning who he is and what he wants and to get our line, uh, our lives in line with his program. I love it that God is a gracious God, don't you? Our God is a patient God. Our God is long-suffering, and he's willing to give people a chance to repent. But in this case, that time has run out. God gave the king a prediction of his future. The big picture God was giving him was that the Most High is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth. That was true then. Is it still true today? Is God the king over all the kingdoms? Is he really the ultimate one in charge of, say, Argentina? Is he in charge of Brazil? Is he in charge of Croatia? Let's skip down the alphabet a little bit. Is he in charge of the United States of America? Amen. All is as God overrules. He gives us a lot of latitude, but ultimately his say is the final one. Well, the prophet urges the king to renounce his sins by doing what is right. And the story continues. As the story continues, we will see that the king does not take the message to heart. Just like this king, some may be hearing predictions of God and maybe make a sideways glance or an eye roll. They don't take predictions in the Bible seriously. Maybe you've heard about the prediction by Harold Camping that Jesus was coming. He was supposed to come on May 21st, 2011. Did he come? No. And this is not the first time Harold Camping has made predictions like this. He's made other predictions. They also failed. And so we might take all predictions, including the ones in the Bible, and we might just kind of put them to the side and say, oh, I can't believe that. But friends, let's not do that. Consider if you, um, if somebody gave you change and you got a $10 bill and you found out that that $10 bill was counterfeit, would you, yeah, would you take all of your cash and throw it away? No, of course not. And the same with, there are people that are making all kinds of predictions today, but I got to tell you where you can go to the source and get the truth right here. Our future is in these pages. The destiny of the world is contained in this book, and we can trust it. Its prophecies are sure. Well, let's see how Daniel's predictions played out. We come to scene three. The dream is fulfilled. Verse 28. All this happened to King Nebuchadnezzar. Twelve months later, as the king was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon, he said, Is this not the great Babylon I have built as a royal residence by my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty? You sense a little ego there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He considered the city of Babylon itself as his personal possession and as a reflection of his great power and glory. In just a minute, I'm going to share a verse that addresses this. But I got to tell you, when I was a young Christian, this is one of the very first verses that somebody shared with me. 
And it has really stuck with me. I'm, I'm really surprised that all these years later, it sticks with me. But you know what? I find it to be true. And I find if we heed this next verse, it'll keep a lot of us out of a lot of trouble. So anyone here want to stay out of trouble? <laughs> all right, here's the verse. Proverbs 16, verse 18 tells us, really warns us, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. God endured Nebuchadnezzar's pride for 12 months. This was a period of grace in which God was giving Nebuchadnezzar an opportunity to turn to him in repentance. It is always better to turn to God before he takes you to the woodshed. Would you agree? Yeah. But, but pride clouds our mind, keeps us from thinking clearly, and sometimes leads us down a wrong path. So what happened? Verse 31. Even as the words were on his lips... A voice came from heaven. This is what is decreed for you, King Nebuchadnezzar. Your royal authority has been taken from you. You will be driven away from people and will live with wild animals. You will eat grass like an ox. Seven times will pass by for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over all the kingdoms on earth and gives them to anyone he wishes. Seven times is probably seven years. We, we see that if you go to chapter seven. And it would take a long time for the king's hair and nails to grow out to the length here described. And the condition of thinking one is an animal is called so anthropy, having the mind of or like an animal. The king ruled over the largest kingdom of the day, from Iran to Saudi Arabia, including Turkey and other peoples and language groups. It was a vast empire of peoples. And yet this great king of all of this is reduced to wandering around as a madman or rather as an animal, for seven years. Now, I find this next thing I'm going to share with you interesting. Uh, archaeologists have found a, a description of this king in this time. And it said he went for a period of time and did nothing. He was not active. He was not managing his kingdom. Uh, to me, that seems to confirm what the Bible is telling us about this king. There's no other king in the ancient Near East that has any kind of inscription like that. They didn't write things like that normally. But this king and this situation were unique. Verse 33. Immediately, what had been said about Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled. He was driven away from people and ate grass like the ox. His body was drenched with the dew of heaven until his hair grew like feathers of an eagle and his nails like the claws of a bird. At the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven and my sanity was restored. Then I praised the Most High. I honored and glorified him who lives forever. Friends, note those three words. I praised and honored him and glorified him. Wow, what a change. He's gone from putting God on a shelf with a bunch of pagan idols to the point where he exalts God before his kingdom reached unto the heavens. Now he understands that God 
is most high. Everything takes second or third place behind him, behind Yahweh. God, not his kingdom, not Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom, is forever. God is the height. God is the power of all powers. God, no other one is in view. And not only who God is is important, but what he does rule. In verse 34, the king reveals what he has learned. His dominion, God's dominion, is an eternal dominion. Friends, what kind? Eternal. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. Nebuchadnezzar describes this dominion, this rule or kingdom. All the peoples on earth are regarded as nothing. He does what he pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples of the earth. No one can hold back his hand or say to him, what have you done? Nebuchadnezzar, the king of the great nation of Babylon, has a new perspective. All people are regarded as unimportant compared to God. God is free. He does what he pleases. He does not have to consult us to decide what he will do. No one can hold him back. God's power and sovereignty are out of this world. Do you agree? Yes. Would you give God a hand, please? <laughs> Amen. Amen. <laughs> Our God is a great God. <laughs> well, now I have a question for you. What happens when people get humble? What happens? Verse 36 tells us, At the same time that my sanity was restored, my honor and splendor were returned to me for the glory of my kingdom. My advisors and nobles sought me out, and I was restored to my throne and became even greater than before. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and glorify the king of heaven because everything he does is right and all his ways are just. And those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. After seven years passed, God restored his sanity. God brought it back to him and he acknowledges God. He looks to heaven and he has a different attitude. He has a different view of life. His pride has been put aside and God has restored his sanity. But not only that, in the, in the grace of God, God chooses to give him even more glory. His kingdom became even greater than before. And after all, here we are, well, some uh, 2,700 years later, we're still talking about King Nebuchadnezzar. God truly has honor of this man. Was Nebuchadnezzar a believer? What do you think? Now, did he start out there? I don't think so. He's got all these gods on a shelf and Yahweh is just another one of those gods. I, I don't think so. But he grew in his understanding. In Daniel chapter 2, chapter 3, and chapter 4, you see this progress in his understanding. He acknowledged God's complete sovereignty. He acknowledged God's omnipotence, his power. And he worshiped God, the king of heaven. There's one more indicator that I think does tell us he was a believer. And that is what he is called. In the book of Jeremiah, Nebuchadnezzar is called the servant of God. And that seems to be a title that's reserved only for true believers in the Bible. 
In the Old Testament, people like Moses were called the servant of God. In the New Testament, people like Paul are called the servant of God. And Nebuchadnezzar is called the servant of God. Was he a believer? I think he was. And I think someday in heaven, we may see Nebuchadnezzar and maybe we'll hear his recounting of this great story. Yeah. All right. I have some applications for you. I have three. First, God is a king and we need to see him for who he is. The ancients wanted a convenient God, one they could control. But if you have a God you can control, then you're God, not him. Any God you can boss around isn't the true God. The true God does not adjust to you. You adjust to him. Our God is not a watchmaker who created the world and then left never to return. He is always overseeing his creation. And he was, is, and always will be its king. God is the divine director of this play called life. God is sovereign over kingdoms, politics, and power. God is merciful and slow to punish, allowing repentance. God is no pansy. He can exercise rule with power, as he did with Nebuchadnezzar. Our God is an awesome God. God is sovereign, and we are his subjects. But those in this world have that reversed. We view man, not God, we view man as the source all, as the end all, be all, Man is the measure of all things in modern thinking. And we need to get back to the biblical idea. It's not about us. It's about God. Second, God has a kingdom. It is eternal and oversees everything. The question is often asked, are we in God's kingdom? And I think there's some understanding on both sides of the answer to that. But what do you think the answer is? Are we in God's kingdom? Yes. I think the answer is yes and no. <laughs> Obviously, you're going to have to come back in future weeks for me to answer that, right? <laughs> but I'll give you a glimpse, okay? If God's kingdom is an eternal kingdom, that means it has no beginning and no end, we must be in his kingdom. He has an eternal rule. He made this world. He rules over the affairs of men. He gives us a lot of latitude, but ultimately he has the final say. He is king. But the Bible also talks about a coming kingdom, a kingdom that I don't think is here yet. Remember what Christ told his disciples to pray? Pray thy kingdom come. Now, it's an eternal kingdom. How can it come? Well, there is a form of this kingdom that has not yet appeared yet. And Christians throughout history, all churches have recognized this truth that Christ is coming back. We may disagree on the particulars, uh, what it looks like exactly, but this is common among all Christians. The Bible says Christ is coming back. We believe that. And I believe he's coming back with a kingdom. He will set up his kingdom and complete the prophecies in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. As the Psalms confirm, this is an eternal kingdom that we are in. Psalm 45, verse 13 says, your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures through all generations. The Lord is trustworthy in all he promises and faithful in all he does. Amen? Yeah. Even though God's kingdom is eternal, yet Jesus spoke of a coming kingdom. 
God's kingdom always exists, and yet there is a future form yet to be. Third and final application. Because God rules, he can and does put down traits that are evil. Traits like we saw in Nebuchadnezzar, his pride. Now, although Nebuchadnezzar's pride is an extreme example, it resides in all of us. Christians are not immune. We must all be careful that pride does not infect our lives. As you go about doing what you do this week, remember, God is our king. Father God, thank you for overseeing this world. We thank you. You are its creator. And as its creator, you have the responsibility and the authority to guide your creation where you want it to go. And Father, you do give mankind a great deal of freedom. And sometimes we don't understand why things work out the way they do. But Father, ultimately, your end goal is a glorious resolve to all that we see as you bring your kingdom to fruition. We thank you, Father, for the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. We thank you that he died on the cross, that he paid for our sins, that he gives us the gift of eternal life to all who believe. And Father, once we believe, we have the opportunity to submit to your kingdom and to walk in your ways. Help us to do that this week and always. I pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Mark. This final song we're going to sing is called Yet Not I, But Christ in Me. It kind of follows that humility theme that we started with Nebuchadnezzar, doesn't it? Only it's the good kind of humility because we know we can't do it anyhow. It's all Christ through us. <clears throat> Stand with us if you would. What gift of grace is Jesus, my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus, for my life is wholly bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine, I can sing all is mine, yet not I, but through Christ in me. The night is dark, but I am not forsaken. For by my side, the Savior, he will stay. I labor on in weakness and rejoicing. For in my need, his power is displayed. To this I hold, my shepherd will defend. I dread, I know I am forgiven. The future sure, the price it has been paid. For Jesus bled and suffered for my pardon. And he was raised to overthrow the grave. To this I hold, my sin has been defeated. Now and ever is my plea. Oh, 
the chains are released, I can sing, I am free, yet not I, but through Christ in me. With every breath I long to follow Jesus, for he has said that he will bring me home and day by day i know he will renew me until i stand with joy before the throne to this i hold my hope is only jesus all the glory evermore Zip shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. All the glory evermore to Him. When the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat. Thank you for being here with us this morning. Our benediction is from Revelation chapter 7. Blessing and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you this week.